So I went back into the game to get the last quest file that I needed so that I could have all achievements. And then I realized that there were new story files that unlocked after the game. So I'm making a little bonus part and read them to you because they are kind of post game content. So have fun. Active times. Where the ducks go? Wards C, Q and D being the same space means that the air ducts in the prep room and lounge don't lead to other wards. Inside is a, is a small space for Gab where he often rests on a rug. The robot with the round helmet on his head is named Sean. He has never been called anything other than that by those in the underground shelter. Odentenforsk Venusk Yuvat. A phrase from Ovid is roughly translates to both love and luck help the ball. 17 years ago, a young mother went jogging in the park. She reached a fork where she usually goes right, but on this day she decided to go left. Why? Because there was a snail on the path. No one knows why she avoided the snail. Was she afraid of them? Or felt a sense of danger from it? Whatever the case may be, the snail caused her to switch to the left path. As a result, she was killed by a girl. The suspect who was taken into custody, a Japanese man, was not the culprit. He was falsely convicted and executed, and his wife, wife committed suicide in her grief. The two left young children behind. The convicted man called a taxi before his arrest, but the taxi ended up picking up another fare instead, a brilliant surgeon. However, the car became involved in an accident, killing the surgeon as well as the young boy who was waiting for an operation by the, the surgeon. If that snail hadn't been on the right path 17 years ago, what would have happened? Life is simply unfair, don't you think? So those are Akane's par parents. A convicted man called a taxi for his arrest. And the surgeon couldn't say if Sean was waiting for a surgery. Cool. Anagram. This must be fate. Fate? Diana smiles weakly from the bed at Sigma's question. Don't you remember? You told me that yourself. Me? I never said it. If it really was me, then... Yes. The Sigma who was 67 inside. Diana shifts her frail hand closer to Sigma, and he gently grasps it between his own. The, the Sigma before her is not the one who was trapped in the shelter. It's the same body, but a different consciousness. On April 13th, 2029, Sigma was at the headquarters of Fresh Keys, his eye and arms replaced with robotic ones. There, the young Sigma returns to his body from 45 years in the future and begins to carry out Akane's instructions. How many years has it been since you came here, Diana? A little over three, I think. I followed you here in May 2029. A violent coughing fit takes over after she speaks. Sigma helps her sit up and softly pats her back until it subsides. Why didn't the medical, medical pod work? I told you, it's fate. Diana's skin is deathly pale, but her eyes still shine with life, just like a child's. I've always dreamt of coming here. Did you know, oh, did you know that Diana is the name of the goddess of the moon? I've waited to do this ever since I was little, so I'm perfectly fine with dying here. What are you saying? I've been able to spend the last three years living with you, Sigma. I've treasured every moment. Sigma lowers his head, his expression pained. Please don't make that face. You don't need to be sad. In the year 2074, you will shift back to Christmas 2028, and the next day, old me will head to the decom facility in the Nevada desert and meet you. Diana nods. Sigma closes his eyes and shakes his head. That's not it. I mean, I'm in love with the you. His declaration stops as Diana's lips close over his in a kiss, and the rest of his words are lost. After a moment, Diana murmurs, It must be a wonderful future, the future where we found each other in 2028. Sigma holds her tightly, aching, heartfelt sobs echo within a cold, silent world. Baby Phi was indeed transported from 1904 to 20, uh, 28, but a Phi also remained in 1904. Whatever happened to that Phi? Rumor is she became a Berlin scientist and worked in a research facility in the US well into her 100s. 
The facility was researching the transporter, and that's where the fire from 1904 is sent. So did she raise herself? The day is bright and clear. A girl in a white dress strolls along the beach, the wind tossing her long blonde hair playfully. Up until a half a year ago, she had been confined to her bed. Carlos' eyes still tear up every time he sees her smile. Come on, Carlos, you don't always have to help me. That's the point of my rehab. Oh, you're right. Sorry, Maria. Carlos brushes her hair out of her face. It's definitely not the summer sun that's making him act out of sorts. It's the fact that his sister is here standing before him. Maria grins up, it, up at him. Why would Akane and Junpei say if they saw you being all fussy like this? It's fine, they understand how important you are to me. Both you and Junpei put your lives on the line. That was a different history. But going through that means we know how to treat reverie syndrome. I can't believe you have the ability to jump through space-time. I'm just glad you're able to control it now. It's all because Carlos met Akane and Junpei that Maria was able to recover. He wishes he could show them just how well she's doing. You're thinking about them right now, aren't you, Carlos? What makes you say that? Because you're smiling. Carlos closes his eyes and his unconscious smile turns fond. They're just about your age. It kind of feels like I gained a brother and, a, and another sister. You are going to their wedding, aren't you? Yeah, and you're coming with me. But there's something Carlos needs to do first. Back when the three of them parted ways, I'll be waiting to hear word from you when you locate the terrorist. Carlos held his right hand out towards Akane and Junpei, and the other two grabbed onto it with their own. There was no way of knowing if Delta was telling the truth, but if he was, one fanatic would kill off all of humanity. Akane and Junpei vowed to find this person and Carlos offered to help. He can still feel the strong bond between the three of them, their hands clasped together tightly. I suppose I better get used to talking more before, before the wedding, huh? Holding her hair out of her face, Maria reaches out to her brother, who takes her hand in his, and they continue walking down the beach. The same blue sky above them stretches over friends Carlos knows he can rely on. Junpei sits upon a white sofa, somewhere within the secret location of Brash Keys, twiddling a pen and sighing. Ah, uh, what else should I say? Laying on the table in front of him is a half-written letter. Suddenly, Akane pops up behind him. What are you doing, Junpei? She playfully teases. Yeah! Junpei dies for, for the letter, but she snatches it from him and begins reading. Let's see. Carlos, without you, Akane and I would have never gotten together. Thank you. Is this an invitation to the wedding? No, it's most definitely not. He makes a grab for the paper, but Akane quickly moves it out of his reach. It's just a progress report, Junpei mutters. Okay, yeah, I mentioned the wedding, but the date hasn't been set yet. I made a promise to you and your brother. You wouldn't get married until we've dealt with a fanatic. Akane's face flushes bright red. She hastily hides her face behind the letter and goes back to reading. I'd like nothing more than to get the approval and blessing of our old friends, and those of you we met six months ago. Eyes wide, Akane glances up at Junpei. He avoids her gaze, awkwardly scratching the back of his head. You know, there's a history where I keep searching for you, even after I'm old and cra craggily. I... it still exists out there somewhere, and when I think of that... A sharp pain jolts through Junpei's face. Akane's pinching her cheek. His cheek. Ah, oh, that hurts! What are you doing? To prove that to you that this isn't a dream. Akane giggles. You still can't believe we're together like this? Junpei shakes his head. You've changed a lot, Junpei. A half a year ago, you were never this honest. It's like... how do you want to describe it? Like a dream? Huh? Junpei leans in and quickly pinches Akane. Oh no, you've done it! She darts forward and goes after Junpei with both hands, getting in a pinch wherever she can, and Junpei does the same. Once they start laughing, it's very hard to stop, and they keep going until they're out of breath. I guess this is all thanks to Carlos too. That's why I'm writing that a thank you letter. On Akana's left hand, a ring glitters on her ring finger. Hey Mira, how are you feeling? Are you lonely? Come on Eric, you visited last week. Eric smiles wryly and reaches out to Mira with his left hand. Mira does the same and their hands with matching silver rings align on either side of the plexiglass window. <laughs> I brought a new guest to see you today. Eric shifts to the side and a head pops up into view. You're... Hey, Mira. Long time no see. It's Sean, right? Yep, I'm happy to you remember. 
Behind Mira, the sun is shining through an iron-barred window, lighting up the visitor room. It's been a long time, Sean. It's good to see you. The smile that appears on her face is real. Mira no longer needs to plaster on a fake one. When I heard you turned yourself in, I was really surprised. Eric was the one who convinced me. He said I should pay for my sins so we could be together. So that's why I got married in jail, Eric ducks his head shyly. Are you sure you're okay with this? Mira asks. He looks at her in confusion. Don't you regret marrying me? I did carve your heart out in another history. Isn't that what you said, Chong? Yeah, you did. Eric looks Mira straight in the eye. I've already told you this a bunch of times. I forgive you. No matter what happens. Besides, you haven't killed me in this history yet, right? Yet? Mirror's lips twist wryly. But the heart rippers killed people already. So many. Sean, stop it. Eric turns angry to Sean, and Mirror's face falls into a frown. But Sean continues speaking. You turned yourself in, Mira, but that doesn't mean you've paid for all the crimes you did. I doubt the families and friends that were left behind would forgive you even if you were put on death row. There's no way you can clear us since here. Mira grits her teeth. But there is a way to clear them. Well, not what you're already done, technically. You have to pay for those your whole life. That will never change. But maybe you can in another universe. Suddenly, Sean's fist crashes through the plexiglass window. Ah! Mira jumps backwards while Eric is frozen in shock. What are you... Eric can't even finish speaking before Sean moves, jumping through the broken window. He kicks the outside wall of the visitor room, causing it to crumble and reveal a giant hole. An alarm immediately starts blaring and police officers rush into the room, but Sean darts forward and takes them all down in a blink of an eye. He holds his hands out to Mira. Let's go! Go where? I know where the transport is being stored. You're saying we could go change history? Eric finally stutters. Sean nods. To stop young Mira from committing murder. Mira, I'm pretty sure that's the only way you can clear your sins. Mira stares out through the hole in the wall at the horizon extending beyond. Thank you for watching, and with that, the game truly is over. Gonna see you guys in the next one. Bye bye.